Well, welcome to this edition of the IFS Zooms In. I'm Paul Johnson, and today we're going to be addressing the incredibly important question of inheritances and transfers of wealth between the generations. How big are they? How much do they matter? How and why have they been growing? And what impact might they have on inequality? Um, To do that, I'm joined by my two colleagues, uh, James Banks uh, and David Sturrock. Over the last four decades or so, um, inheritances, transfers between parents and their children have become more and more important and bigger as a share of national income. And new IFS research has now looked ahead uh, to examine the prospects for inheritances that will be received by those born in the 1960s, 1970s and 1980s. So this is an issue of considerable uh, interest at the moment, something that one of the many things that's likely to be affected by uh, by COVID and the current crisis, but also something that may have significant effects for uh, the way that the economy and society works over the next really quite long period. So some of what we're going to be talking about today uh, is uh, work funded by the Nuffield Foundation, which uh, we've published recently. But before we go into some of that specifics, it's worth really getting down to the question of why this really matters. It is a matter of huge public um, interest. But perhaps, James, we can start by uh, j- just just exploring that question of why it is that people get so worked up about the role of inheritances and why this is actually a terribly important social and economic issue. It's always, Yes, thanks, Paul. It's, it's always good to start by asking why do we care. And I think that... Um, when we think about events, economic events or economic policies or just economic growth in general, we're always asking who gains and who loses. And of course, one of those dimensions of gaining and losing is often the old versus the young. We hear the battle of the generations all the time. Uh, you know, and But often it's not nearly as simple as that. It's not a battle of you know one generation winning versus another losing. It's not even a zero-sum game. Uh, because the generations are linked, and they're linked through families. Um, So in order to sort of understand properly who's gaining and who's losing, we really need to understand the linkages between generations, as opposed to just saying, oh, well, you know, the old people lost out and the young people benefited or the reverse. So we need to understand those linkages, and we need to acknowledge them when we're assessing policies. Um, We need to understand them partly, we just you know, scientifically, I think we really want to understand how families behave, how much are parents altruistic to their children or to their own parents? How much do they behave selfishly in uh, keeping the gains of particular events or policies to themselves? Um, And also, how much are their strategic, if you like, strategic um, mechanisms? So economists sometimes talk about the idea that children may do things in return for inheritance. So you might care for your parents in return for um, some receipt of housing wealth, for example, when they die. So there are all these interesting economic sort of scientific mechanisms at play, and they're really crucial to understand how we assess policies and how we assess growth or the effects of growth in the economy. So it really relates to this idea, I suppose, of how much can your family provide you with opportunity or so for example levels of wealth in families can give opportunities to the children in those families or a lack of wealth can maybe lead to barriers to opportunity in those families so it's really one could think of it as being related to what you think of the social mobility agenda or the persistence of inequality across generations how much are you limited by the family that you had the good luck or the bad luck to be born into. Now, a lot of that debate really focuses on the effects of the family when children are young. Schools, parental behaviours, early life, nutrition. There's lots of opportunities that, that can be conveyed or, or uh, to children when they're young. But actually, these family transfers are happening all through people's lives and in, in multiple directions, and they can have many effects. So Family transfers can insure you against, for example, unemployment shocks or health shocks throughout your life. Um, they can uh, 
anticipate the anticipation of future wealth being provided to you by your family can change your behavior now if you know you're going to inherit a large house at age 50 that can totally change the way that you have to go about your financial planning in your life in your 30s that can give you lead to many different opportunities so all these transfers that are happening between parents and children and now actually between grandparents and grandchildren are having effects on people's behavior all through life. And those effects will in turn mean that the effects of policies or the effects of economic events are going to be mitigated across the generations. So in order to understand policy better, we have to understand these effects better. Um, and, And finally, maybe one other thing which I might say is that the... The welfare state, if you like, in the broader sense, and that would include health, social care, education and state benefits, is is much smaller in, in many senses than it used to be in the UK. So some of the transfers that used to be happening through the public sector, through the welfare state, are now not happening so much as they were. And therefore, these family transfers that step in maybe to insure people or to provide opportunities are potentially getting more important than they were. I think that's an aspect right now of why the debate is particularly important, is that this is a sense in which if the welfare state's getting smaller, then private insurance coming through the family is getting larger. And does that mean essentially that the inequality and the persistence of inequality across the generations is becoming more of a problem than it used to be? So that's a pretty uh, comprehensive set of reasons for caring. It really impacts the inher- expectation or the reality of inheritance really impacts on people's behaviour even before it arrives and also can have a really significant effect um, on uh, inequality and social mobility because, of course, we know that inheritances are pretty or very um, unequally distributed, certainly relative to uh, what the state might uh, might do for you. So... Um, Perhaps we should go on now to talk a little bit about what we know about the scale um, of uh, inheritances. And for that, I'll, I'll move on to, um, to, to David. Um, so, David, what, 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 what do we think is happening uh, to the uh, amount of inheritance that, that people are getting and indeed that, how that might change over the next, uh, over the next, uh, over the next period? Well, first of all, just to set things in a little bit of historical context, as you've already alluded to, Paul, uh, the size of inheritances, the flow each year has been increasing fairly steadily since around the 1970s. And we're talking about amounts that have risen from around 4 to 5% of national income to now something a bit more than 8% of national income. And so noting, also as James has done, that these uh, transfers, these flows can have very important consequences we wanted to ask, well, is that trend set to continue? Um, And if so, um, in what way exactly? What might the implications be for inequality? So in the piece of work funded by the Nuffield Foundation that we've just published, we tried to go about answering that. Um, So our method for doing that was to start off by looking at the wealth held by different generations of younger people, those at working age today. So when we do that, we saw, first of all, that uh, those born later had parents that held significantly more wealth than those who were born before them. So to take one example, the parents of those born in the 1980s held about 40% more wealth than the parents of those born in the 1970s did when they were at the same age. And what we then uh, have tried to do is to, to say, given how people tend to spend on that wealth and then pass it on, what does that imply about the scale of inheritances coming down the road? And our answer to that question is, well, it does look like the trend of the increasing size of inheritances is set to continue. And that's not just in terms of the absolute amounts of wealth that are going to be transferred, but also when we compare that wealth that's going to be received to the Uh, incomes from work that might be received by those generations. So inheritances as a share of of total income of your lifetime look set to rise further uh, in the coming decades. 
So that's a really important finding that inheritances have broadly doubled as a fraction of national income over the last few decades, set to increase because um, uh, parents of uh, later generations have got more wealth themselves. And probably I think the most uh, important thing that you said there, David, is that inheritances are growing as a fraction of the, the lifetime resources of of later generations. So your inheritance, your parents' wealth is actually becoming more important to your lifetime incomes than it has been in the past, but but perhaps not the highest ever. I mean, if, if we look back many, many decades, um, maybe we're returning, as some have said, to a Victorian age. Uh, yes, well, if we look in the sort of grander um, swathe of history, then um, some great and interesting work that's been done by some economic historians has shown that if you went back, say, 100 years or a bit more, then the share of inheritance compared to a national income was far larger than it is today in the UK and in, uh, in much of Europe. Um, and that actually dec- declined quite dramatically uh, around the period, um, around the First and Second World War. And as, as we've been discussing, has been rising again over the past few decades. So some of you might be familiar with the, the work of um, uh, Tom R. Piketty, which has been exploring that trend um, and some of the implications of it. And it does seem to be kind of one of the potentially defining trends uh, over the very long term for advanced economies going forwards. And there are two trends, uh, just to pick them out, that I think you talked about. One is that the the wealth of uh, the older generations, those in their 50s, 60s, 70s, has been growing over time, partly as a result of increased home ownership and house prices and so on. So that's one thing that's making inheritance more important. And the other thing is that for the younger generations, income and earnings has been really stagnant. And I mean, they're very unusually in historical terms. They're not getting any better off than their parents. Yes, that's, that's exactly right. If we, if we look back... Um really kind of as far as we have data to be able to do so in the UK, then we've tended to see that for each generation, they've earned more than those who were born a bit before them had done at the same age. So someone who was born in the 1940s or 1950s tended to earn about 20% or maybe a bit more, uh, more than their predecessor of 10 years before them. But if you turn and you look at people uh, who are in the 30s and 40s today, then they're in fact earning about the same amount as those uh, 10 years previous did. And we kind of think that actually, you know, this has gone on for, for such a long period of time now that it really means that the lifetime incomes of today's working generations are not going to be that much different from those who went just before them. So what that means is that if you have uh, some sort of income, inheritances that are growing strongly, whereas earnings from work aren't, well, then the former is just going to become more important um, in terms of people's overall resources. A, a rather depressing conclusion, I think, that we're not, um, you know, we're, we're stagnating in terms of our earnings and productivity and living standards during our lives and becoming more dependent on inheritance. But Paul, I mean, maybe uh, maybe I could just come in there because it, it goes back to thinking about the benefit who gains from sustained periods of economic growth, um, and what the I mean, leaving aside the inequality issues, what the rising fraction of inheritance is showing you is that there have been some benefits of the past economic growth that were essentially in the first order in, uh, income. Uh, uh, that were essentially went to the older generations are actually being passed on to the younger generations. So there is some kind of smoothing there. Now, the inequality cons- consequences of that may be rather poor, but at least there, it's kind of an interesting perspective on it that it says, look, actually, we haven't just spent them all. We are actually choosing to consume some of them. And the younger generations are, in some sense, benefiting from the past economic growth. Yeah, I think that's a really, uh, that's a really important point that... Um inheritance as you say is a way of distributing resources from one generation to the next so if one generation does well the next generation can do well as a result but let's come on to that point about um inequality um most people i think take the, the i think the biggest concern that people have about the increasing importance of inheritance is that you know from at least one perspective it doesn't look 
fair. So if you happen to be lucky enough to have uh, wealthy parents, then you'll inherit a lot. Um, and if you're not, then you won't. And as that becomes more important, you'd think that that would increase uh, inequality over time. So wh- wh- what do we know about that, David? Well, when it comes to inequality, actually, the, the picture um, in relation to inheritance is maybe slightly surprising, or at least a little bit more complicated than you might first expect. So it's absolutely the case that the distribution of inheritances is very unequal. So um, those who are leaving the largest inheritances are going to be leaving substantially more uh, than those who are, who are obviously further down the distribution. Uh, a substantial minority will probably be leaving nothing to their children. But if we look back at the distribution of inheritances that have been received by previous generations and how that actually relates to their um, other resources, then um, while it's absolutely the case that it's those who already have more wealth and who have higher incomes who are receiving larger inheritances, actually the size of inheritances received in proportion to those lifetime incomes and to that wealth already held is actually quite similar across uh, the distribution. So actually, and and this holds true across uh, quite a few different countries, inheritances don't look, at least uh, in the kind of initial snapshot, to have a big impact on the distribution of wealth and of lifetime incomes. It's important to be clear, just uh, just to be clear exactly what that means, because I think that's a, that's a really important point here. What what you're saying is that if if um, if I've earned a million quid and I inherit a million quid, I've doubled my wealth, and if I've only earned ten thousand quid and I've inherited ten thousand, I've also only doubled my wealth. So. In your way of describing that, that's not an increase in inequality because the ratio between those two people remains the same, even if the absolute gap has increased by nearly a million pounds. Yes, that's, that's exactly the, the point that I'm making. And I think I should sort of caveat it in saying that you know, lots of people react to that by saying, well, it's still the case that inheritances are increasing those absolute gaps, and that's something that we care about. And absolutely, that may be the case, and that may be very valid. Um, but... In the, in the sort of way that we strictly define inequality, it's, it's not increasing inequality. But perhaps what it is uh, that that's kind of raises some concerns about inheritances and their impact on people's lifetime incomes may not be the uh, effect on just the uh, distribution of, of lifetime income on inequality per se, but in inequalities... Uh, by parental background. So if it's the case that where you end up in life depends more on who your parents are than it did in the past, then that might be uh, something that people are worried about, that they think that policy should be doing something about, even if it doesn't actually uh, mean that there's an increase in inequality in that generation. And of course, um, James, as you were saying uh, at the beginning, inheritance is only part of this story. I mean, your parents matter to you in all sorts of ways in terms of your start in life and how well you do in life, which may actually be more important than the amount of money you end up with when they die. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I think it's a really interesting question if you could if you could write down a, a sort of list of all the ways in which your parents matter uh, and sort of try and divide up the pie I mean you can never unbake the cake so these things don't really typically divide up additively you couldn't say it's 10 percent your childhood diet and five percent your schooling and 25 percent your housing um, but if you know you could write down your wish list of all these things where parents matter and then it'd be very interesting to ask how much is inheritances at the end of that. And I think, well, the inheritance might be large in money terms, I think, in terms of opportunities, because you've got to remember that people typically receive inheritances rather late in their lives. And and in fact, now their parents are living longer, people are receiving inheritances even later than they used to. Um, and, and there are many forms of even financial transfers that happen before the parents die. So what we talk about as inter vivos transfers, so um, whether this might be paying your children's university fees um, or helping with a down payment on a house or maybe if someone 
uh, has unemployment uh, in the middle of their working life than covering some financial expenses. So, so there are many financial transfers as well that happen in adult life between parents and their children. So, so I think it's a really interesting question to say, how much do all of these individual components account for the total transfers across the generations? And I, I agree with you. I think that the inequality creating bit of it may well be much more in the non-inheritance part rather than the inheritance part. So um, we can't uh, we can't obviously talk about this whole topic at the moment without thinking about um, uh, what's happening uh, with um, COVID. We know that um, COVID is uh, having a real impact on the earnings of young people. Uh, that a, a lot of young people are losing their jobs. Uh, we know that a lot of them are in those sectors like hospitality and retail and so on that have been locked down and that are doing. Um, very badly, but looking at through the other um, end of the telescope, what 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 do we also know about the economic prospects of the older generation at the moment? Well, I mean, it's an interesting point that's not been so much debated. I, I agree with you. Um, the there's two sort of main margins I think that we know a little bit about. Again, much as with much COVID stuff, we are unable to quantify things very precisely at the moment because much of the data that we are relying on in the longitudinal studies is still you know, coming on stream. Um, but the two main channels, I suppose, if you're, uh, let's say you're 50 and over and you're thinking, I mean, what the first thing to say is that obviously the 50s and overs have been by far disproportionately expected uh, affected on the health side of things. So that is where the mortality and that is where the uh, the big effects of, for example, um, having other types of hospital procedures that are rationed. So there are huge health costs on these generations. But leaving all that aside, when it comes to the economic costs, the first is that, you know, those who are approaching retirement but have not yet retired are going to be having a negative hit to their retirement savings through the changing uh, stock market, the changing value of their wealth. Um, and that's particularly important for people with defined contribution pensions. So essentially, it, your retirement saving will have been hit for those who've yet to retire. And not only that, but many of those households haven't really got too long to adjust. So it's true whilst the, uh, there are large lifetime effects on the young, the young have also got a lifetime <laughs> to work to uh, before retirement to essentially um you know to for those effects to sort of be spread out whereas a, a shock that's happening close to retirement can have quite large consequences if you've got very few years in the labor market to to recover from it um so that's one thing the, the hit to retirement wealth the other thing is it, you know there have been employment shocks for older workers uh, it, older workers are um, in terms of their representation in the so-called affected sectors, the big affected sectors by COVID, whether that's hospitality or whatever, they are actually averagely represented. So that, uh, you know, the young are overrepresented, we know, uh, but the old are actually averagely represented even in those affected sectors. And there are lots of key workers. In fact, a large fraction of key workers are older workers. And they, so they will be also affected by health risks. So it's not the case that there are no employment effects for older workers. Um, and in fact, the, the the particular point to make there is we've seen from studying past recessions that when unemployment shocks hit older workers, they tend to be more persistent. You know, there's less ability for older workers to retrain and reskill into different industries. There's less incentives for employers to retrain or reskill their older workers if they're going to stay around for long for for less years when they are retrained. So we do tend to think of these unemployment shocks as being more permanent for the older workers. So again, it's going to be an inequality story. The older workers who've had an employment shock are going to be badly hit quite persistently. And if that couples with a pension wealth shock, then that could have quite a big effect on the retirement resources with really very little opportunity for those people to recover. Um, having said that, you're also, it's also the case that there will be wealthy generations of pensioners who've already retired who are pretty much immune from the, con the economic consequences of COVID. Their pensioners are already being withdrawn. They're indexed. Uh, they've even got the triple lock benefits on their state pension. So really, there are, they're not working anyway. So there are large factors of the older population who are sort of immune to the economic consequences. Yeah, I think that's uh, you know that, that's very 
important that uh, some of those in their late 50s, early 60s, perhaps in work could be quite badly affected. But once you're receiving uh, your pension, economically at least, uh, you're pretty much um, protected from the serious economic consequences of uh, what's been happening. What, what do we what, what can we speculate though about um, how any of this might impact on the sort of main topic of our discussion today, which is this issue of the uh, likely scale of uh, inheritances and transfers uh, from the older generation to the younger? Can we say anything about how COVID might impact that? Stepping back and thinking through in theory, what might matter? Obviously, if you've got less retirement wealth for the people who do have less retirement wealth they will need to use a larger fraction of their retirement wealth on themselves to 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 essentially finance their own consumption plans during retirement so one might expect inheritances to fall for that group because if you like the supply of wealth uh coming from that you know uh, is gone down um and the also they might even choose even for the people who haven't had a retirement wealth shock you might imagine people anticipating reducing their inheritances a little bit because we know one thing we know is there's going to be much more uncertainty in the future for quite a while now uncertainty over future taxes uncertainty over health social care costs you know the covid crisis has brought home i think a lot of issues around the quality and financing of social care so it might well be that some older generations are going to think oh well you know i'm going to might need a bit more of my retirement wealth than i otherwise have thought just to finance their own retirements so that both those might point to a little bit of a reduction in inheritances. But on the other hand, you've got to remember that we've already discussed the fact that inheritances are flowing up and down, sometimes to compensate or ensure future generations. So all these older people have children and have grandchildren who are going to be the ones who are affected by the COVID shocks. And so one might affect some smoothing again of these consequences, both, you know, there might be into vivos transfers now from the current elderly who are maybe immune from the economic shocks down to the children and the grandchildren who are really bearing the brunt of them and there might be slightly more inheritances as a proportion of the existing wealth um, in the future as if for the same reasons essentially to sort of bring some of those relative benefits or in this case relatively small as opposed to relatively large losses and sort of smooth that across the generations so essentially you know it's a typical economist's answer is it could go up could go up could go down but i think that there are these really interesting and important theoretical mechanisms why it could go one way versus the other yeah i think that's really uh, really interesting it is in this kind of odd world in a way in which it could be that the older generation end up with less wealth but um, bequeath more of it uh, because they're concerned about the uh, bigger impact it's had on on their younger relatives. David, I think you wanted to come in on that. Yes, uh, there is a little bit of evidence actually um, about uh, potential importance of these these transfers already during the, the past few months in the UK. Um, one of the surveys that has been running during the uh, crisis period, the Understanding Society survey has been asking people about whether or not they've given and received help, uh, financial help to people outside of their household. And it, particularly younger people, particularly low income younger people who've experienced um, a loss of earnings um, as a result of the crisis um, are quite likely um, to have reported uh, receiving some, some such help. So when I say likely, I mean it's kind of something that they report um, as commonly as kind of um, taking out new borrowing or drawing down, drawing down on their savings. So it does look like um, help from from parents and other relatives um, is, is potentially already um, becoming important in the way that James was was uh, suggesting. And I guess the other thing to you might think about here, which is often thought of in a slightly different lens, uh, is housing. And so, you know, we know that a large fraction of people's bequests and inheritances are in the form of housing and if if you're just going to be leaving your house to your kids uh, or to be divided amongst the kids and then as the value of that house changes then the value of the bequest changes in some sense financially although the house itself is obviously still the same house with the same amount of consumption services um, so I think a lot of 
and uh, so for for the large fraction of the distribution, I think a lot of the value of the inheritances that will be coming down in the future may well be tied to the future value of the housing market, and that's something I think which is very again, very uncertain as to how the ver- different types of houses in different types of areas will be affected by COVID. Something that's kind of interesting there that some economists are, are speculating about is that, um, you know, on the one hand, when you uh, have a shock like we've just seen, you might expect that um, the price of housing is going to potentially go down, particularly after um, the sort of shock, which might mean that living really close to your work in a, in a, in a big city is not such a priority as it used to be. But on the flip side, um, one of the big drivers of increases in house prices over the past few decades has been uh, falling interest rates. So the ability of people to to borrow um, and uh, use that to buy a house. And another thing that tends to happen in response to crises uh, like these is that interest rates stay lower for longer. So actually at the same time, we've got this kind of effect which might be pushing up uh, house prices. So there's actually a bit of a a debate about even, um, you know, which which way the effects will go on house prices and potentially those are actually, maybe they're going to be pushed up a bit um, if that interest rate channel is important. Yeah, I've a huge amount of uncertainty there in terms of what's going to happen to the value of this most important part of wealth, the housing wealth, and that may change across the country very um very significantly. So the um, I think what, what I take from uh, from this discussion is that uh, inheritances um, have clearly become much more important over the last um, few decades. Uh, as we heard at the beginning, they've doubled as a fraction of national income, and they're going to continue to become more important over the next few decades because we're still going through a period where the older generations are richer than their predecessors. Because earnings um, haven't been doing very well, inheritances are an increasingly important part of the lifetime uh, income and wealth of uh, younger people, but very unequally distributed. So uh, lots of people will receive very little, um, as a, as a lot of people receive rather a lot, and that clearly um, you know, creates a lot of concern about uh, fairness and equity. As James said right at the beginning, this is, this is at the same time as the role of the state uh, in redistributing has become less important, and that may uh, exacerbate the impact of uh, of, of this uh, role for inheritances. And then we layer uh, the uh, current crisis on top, and we've got a huge amount of uncertainty about the impact that that's going to have. It may well be that the older generation help ensure uh, when they've got the wealth, uh, younger uh, younger people who are struggling um, uh, in the labour market. On the other hand, they may have less to leave, and with this huge uncertainty about what might happen to housing. So as ever with these podcasts, we leave you with at least as many questions uh, as, we, uh, as we started with, reflecting the, uh, the, the complexity and importance of the issues that, of course, um, we're tackling. But we've come to the end of our time for this um, episode. If you did enjoy this episode, please hit subscribe and, and rate us. And you can always um, stay on top of our latest work by visiting www.ifs.org.uk where you'll find a huge amount of work on this sort of topic as well as uh, on uh, COVID specifically. Stay well and we look forward to speaking to you again soon.